Thank, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. How are you? You enjoy your lunch? Excellent. Well, I, I hope I just don't disappoint you after that. After that lovely uh, introduction, uh, uh, there are many, many things I could talk about uh, today, uh, and I'm certainly happy to take questions on, on politics, media, or whatever. But I thought, as I am in front of a group of graduates, a very distinguished group of people, some, some of you um, I, I have met before, but obviously for the first time today. I thought I would spend um, a little bit of time talking about uh, education. I am in the, uh, in the very happy position of being a, a Vice Chancellor's Fellow at this wonderful uh, University of Melbourne. I mean, what a place it is, and the sense of pride now around the campus, uh, given the way that Melbourne is punching out in research and in every other way, it, I think is just a palpable around the place. But I am actually just down the road. I'm located at the Graduate School of Education. I think I'm pointing in the right direction. I'm on the fourth floor, and my neighbours are all of the teachers and researchers in early childhood. And uh, this is this is very nice for me, actually. It squares a circle because uh, I sit there just a, a few uh, offices down from Professor Colette Taylor, uh, who is uh, uh, really uh, internationally recognised for the research work she has done in early childhood. And Colette was one of the first people I went to when I had the portfolio of early childhood to ask her to provide us with uh, um, expertise on the advisory council that we set up and to help us to guide uh, the, uh, the very different structures that we put in place. So it's very nice to be coming back now to, to work with Colette in a, in a different capacity. And actually, by coincidence, if you look at today's newspapers, you will see reports of actually the first assessment of early childhood services across Australia. And this is all services. It's preschool, long day care, family day care. And the good news <coughs> is that 55% are exceeding the new national standards that were put in place in 2009. Now, if you think that figure should be higher, I agree. Um, but the standards, and this is the good news, the standards were deliberately set to a very high standard. Um, often when the Commonwealth and the states get together, uh, you can sit together in a room and nobody wants to, uh, everyone wants to get out of town on a camp on a Friday evening and get that five o'clock flight back. Um, and that can tend to mean that you get a lowest common denominator result. But on this case, I have to say, we, um, we really reach for the stars and um, uh, we, uh, I think, uh, set a very high standard indeed. And that's, that's been acknowledged. And all of the states, uh, none of them have backed out of their agreements. One of the biggest changes, by the way, and I know I've been speaking to some teachers in this room, apart from improved ratios, which is very important, we have the first nationally approved curriculum guide as well for early learning, uh, but also, importantly, the insistence of standards of professional qualifications. Now, it's extraordinary thing to think that for a long time we've been cavalier about this. When you think about it, when parents enroll their children in a primary school, they absolutely know that their child will be taught by a four-year trained university teacher and that that teacher will go on to enrich their professional development you know, for many years after. But up until quite recently, we had no such expectations or demands of those looking after two or three or four-year-olds. And yet we all know the early years are critical. How well children develop their language and other skills when they are very young determines to a large extent how well they will fare in their first years of school. So right now, this is a, the major task underway is to train sufficient numbers of early childhood staff. And the new standards certainly mandate a requirement for all centres of a certain size to employ trained early childhood teachers and for other staff to have a certificate of three or, or diploma qualifications. Now, that's going to be a decade-long effort, and I know a colleague always says, well, we've just got to hang in there and hold our nerve. And as I say, we're, we're doing this for a particular reason. It is not so that, I don't want this to be misunderstood, it's not so that three-year-olds can be you know, speaking Mandarin or doing algebra. That's not what it's about. <coughs> but what we do want is an early childhood experience that means that our youngest start school as happy, confident learners. And if we get that right, I think we also start to think about how we might restructure the early years of primary schooling so that we're providing not, not, not just a rich academic experience, but an enlivening, creative one as well. Then I think we might be able to uh, take some of the 
what I might call the neuralgia out of uh, our somewhat scratchy education debates. Now, I'm just going to pause here and then have a little bit of uh, video entertainment as a way, because this is my television background coming in, as a way of thinking about this. My wonderful technology assistant here, Puna, is going to help me here. As a way of thinking about what I've just said and, and to point to why my further comments, I just want to play you a YouTube video. It's just about five minutes. And I came across it just the last couple of days ago. It's very arresting. It's a presentation by a British born scholar, but now US based uh, chap called Sir Ken Robinson. Some of the audience may have heard of him. Uh, he has had, had a very significant uh, role to play in recent times about talking about the role of the arts in education. He was a very influential figure uh, when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, and he's written some very compelling books on this topic. So as you see, uh, we'll have a look at this video now, there's a very compelling narration around some great graphics as well. We'll just have a look, look at this. Century. How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week. That's not the recent term is demonstrating. But how do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is, they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well, and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. So people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, so, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course, we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists of a capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. <laughs> and the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos within many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescription 
for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and children and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being besieged with information that calls their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising volumes, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing now for getting distracted. From what? No. Boring stuff. Not at school, for the most part. It seems to me, not a coincidence totally, that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Uh, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit order increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> Think straight in Arkansas, <laughs> and by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. <laughs> there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the art particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at <coughs> peak, when you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you're fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children for education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model... Yeah, I'll, is just, I'll just stop it there. So that we, I, I think from judging from the reaction in the audience, you get the point there. We are I mean, that's extraordinary to think about, is that we are anesthetizing our children when we should be waking them up. Now, I hope you you can see there, uh, Ken Roberts has obviously used US statistics there. I don't know what they would be in Australia, but you know, we wouldn't be too far behind. And that's rather sobering. I spoke to Dr. John Hattie uh, recently. He is uh, one of the senior researchers at the Graduate School of Education. And he startled me because uh, we were talking about some aspects of the, the Gonski funding model, which will see much more money directed, quite rightly in my view, to uh, the most disadvantaged students in our schools, but also to those students who are uh, determined to have a learning um, a problem or a disability. In Hattie's view, he said this could well be a recipe to see any even a greater ballooning of children, of numbers of children, identified as disabled, so to attra attract extra loadings. I mean, let's hope that's not the case, but it could be one of the, if you like, the perverse consequences of what we're about to do. Now, I guess the main, one of the main reasons, apart from that, I think it's one of the more arresting presentations I've seen in terms of explaining where we're at and, and why there is now so much discussion about reframing schooling. I'm certainly away from what uh, anyone in this uh, room would have, would have recognised. Um, but it seems to me it's this, this question of, of what we are doing in our schools and whether it's working anymore. And I find that quite compelling. Uh, if, like me, you've been paying attention to some of the recent data on Australian students, you'll be questioning the effectiveness of our present approach. And you see, for quite some time, we've contented ourselves with the fact that Australia is in one of the top ten performing, high-performing countries on education performance. We come in way above the United States and countries like the United Kingdom, but below Finland, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong and Shanghai. Now that is on international benchmarking, an international benchmarking system that we call PISA, and that stands for Program for International Student Assessment, as I'm discovering there's lots of acronyms in education. 
Now, that, the PISA study measures the performance of 15-year-olds in participating countries in math, science, and reading. But it's not all good news for Australia. For the past decade, PISA has been telling us a couple of things. That we have a very large gap, about two, le two learning years, we think, between our best and our least able students. And that's what we call the equity gap in education. And closing that gap, in part, is what is driving um, the thinking of David Gonski. The other worrying trend, and this has been picked up by PISA, is that when it comes to reading, Australia is the only high-performing country to show a significant decline over the past decade. And that's a st statistically significant decline of about 13 points. Now, why is that the case? We're not sure, but we do know from the PISA-related surveys that, for instance, Canadian teenagers list reading as one of their favourite recreational activities. Australian students do not. Most worrying of all is that over a 10 year period as well, PISA is now telling us that our best students are no longer achieving at their peak level, either in reading proficiency or in mathematical literacy. Now again, when I ask the experts about this, they're tending to take the view that we are simply not challenging our best students enough. They're not being stretched. In terms of reading, for instance, whether it's struggling students or the more gifted, what we need to think about is perhaps providing richer reading material, not the dumbed-down stories that fit somebody's idea of the comfort zone. The New South Wales Board of Studies has recently made this point. Their head, Tom Alginarius, has said that when students are given access to good writers, their resistance to reading can be overcome, and they gain confidence that the books others read are not beyond them. So with PISA, that's one set of red lights that are really flashing. So that's for teenagers. What about our primary school children? Well, people in education get an even bigger shock. Uh, they certainly got one at the end of last year when the PEARLS results, sorry, another acronym, when the PEARLS results were released. Now that stands for Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. This assesses year four students, so at nine, ten year olds. And last year was the first time that Australian uh, primary children took part again in this international benchmarking. Now, when the results were, were published, there were a lot of red faces. Australia was not in the top 10. Anyone know how we were ranked? Anyone follow the Pearl's results? Anyone want to make a guess? As I say, we're top 10 in, in Pisa. But where were we in Pearl's? Number 27. Number 27, alongside Slovenia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Austria. We had, the results show, a very long tail of underachievers. But again, it was the performance of our best students that was underwhelming. Only 10% of Australian students achieved at the top advanced benchmark, and that compares with about, say, 24 25% of students in Singapore who achieved at the highest level. Now, I'd be the first to say all of these results are still being analysed and digested, but I'll just give you a flavour of the, the conclusions that I'm picking up, because I, I just think this is, this is so important. Dr Sue Thompson uh, at the Australian Council for Educational Research, ACR, uh, Sue has been analysing this kind of data for many, many years and across uh, most countries. She's concluding that we are failing on a number of fronts. First of all, that we are not exposing our children from a very early age to a rich oral tradition. The recitation of rhymes, poetry, drama, all those things that Ken Robinson would say are important in waking up our aesthetic senses. And secondly, Sue makes the point that we spend far too much time focusing on achieving a minimum standard. Now, that's best explained by comparing the NAPLAN data, sorry, another one, NAPLAN you've all heard of, I'm sure your grandchildren are all sitting in NAPLAN tests, so they're, they're, that's the, they're the Australian testing that now runs through the system. But if we compare, compare the NAPLAN with pearls. NAPLAN read is tested this way. Children are shown, primary children, are shown a paragraph, and they have to make certain comments about that, three facts or interpret, just a paragraph. Pearls, by contrast, actually requires children to read a story. 
You know what a story is, you actually have to turn the pages. It might go for four or five pages. Students are required to read at length. Well, this is proving a challenge for our year four students. And if that isn't ringing alarm bells with you, I'd be, I'd be very surprised. If we don't get this right in primary school, then as we all know, children won't make the transition to reading more complex material, and certainly they won't be developing uh, the abstract skills they will need to understand and cope with high school work, let alone university work. Now, it appears, again, when I talk to people in the graduate school like uh, Pat Griffin, John Hattie and others, that on the studies we have, we've now actually got too few teachers in the system who are capable of extending the higher thinking skills of our students. Now, as you know, there's a vigorous debate underway about how we train our teachers, who gets into our teaching um, uh, institutions, the quality of the course material, and how we provide, provide professional development after. And that's, that's a very good debate to be had, having. Melbourne, though, to its great credit, the University of Melbourne, has resolved that one because it's already made the decision it will only take graduates and preferably graduates have, who've had something of significant life experience. Uh, so they take a more mature student, uh, someone who has really decided they have a genuine vocational commitment and want to teach. Uh, and that is, that is showing dividends because the MGSD graduates are, are certainly highly prized. You have principals actually coming to the school and say, saying, how many can we have that are actively recruiting? Now, there's certainly many examples of innovative practice out there. But I think it's also reasonable to say that on the basis of this data that I talked about, in Australia, I think we've just got too much of the, you know, the same old, same old going on, and it's not doing the job. So this is the backdrop uh, that is now the, to the debate that is now underway about how we fund our schools. And if the Commonwealth proposal to the states is accepted, and keep in mind we're talking about a huge extra investment of $14 billion, that is on top of the existing funding, the, the bulk of the funds go into the government sector, with the highest amounts going to, as I say, um, those students deemed to be disadvantaged. The Gonski formula establishes a resource benchmark of what's required to educate a student in the 21st century. Interestingly, according to Gonski, the two biggest states, New South Wales and Victoria, are the states that are currently way below that benchmark. Um, but uh, it's also interesting to look at their performance. New South Wales and Victoria consistently outperform the rest of the country. You can interpret that two ways. They've either been doing it on the cheap, uh, or it's good bang for the buck. <laughs> But I think the question is, and it's a compelling one, given that Gonski in part is being funded by taking money out of universities, and I think highly regrettable decision. But the question is this, what will we get for this extra investment of $14 billion? That's the question. What are schools going to do with the money? Will the money be invested in what we know works? Now, remarkably, that is a difficult question to answer, given all of the research in this area. I'm trying to get a handle on it by looking in more depth at the data that the ACDR has compiled. And it seems to me if we consider a sample of high-performing schools, whether they're poor schools or affluent schools, and we cast a clinical eye of what is going on in the classrooms in those schools, how teachers are working with each and every child to extend them, and how that practice is documented and peer reviewed, then that is a valuable guide. Now, it sounds pretty basic to me, but any number of reports have been written for a decade and a half now that tell us that we are not good at learning from the best. We get a success story here and a success story there, but the system as a whole does not learn from that individual success, which is why I suggest we have the patchy performance that we do in this large equity gap. In the months ahead, you're going to hear a lot of talk about school improvement plans, about the importance of principal autonomy, and all of this is going to be rolled out in a very expensive government marketing campaign. But I have to say my advice to you is to consider this most important question of all, and that is how we ensure that our schools and school leaders are not improvising, but actually paying attention to the evidence, that they're organising their schools on the basis that all children can achieve 
if their individual needs are addressed. Now, look, this is the attitude. I mean, you always, as I say, you look at the best and see what they're doing. Um, if you look at Finland, <laughs> you know, Finland tops all of those lists of high performance. You know, interestingly, about 15 years ago, when, or well, no, longer actually, about 20 years ago, when they set out to change their system, uh, they didn't say, we want to be number one. They didn't say that at all. They said, we actually, they started with first principles. They said, we want a system that gives us academic excellence and rigor, but we also want a system based on equity. So those twin principles, excellence and equity, guided everything that they did. They invest in every level of learning, from early childhood <coughs> right through to tertiary. Finnish teachers, as many of you would know, have tremendously high status. And it's not because they're paid over the odds. They're paid well, but not spectacularly. Primary teachers, interestingly, primary teachers are amongst the most admired professionals in Finland. Nobody gets to teach in Finland without a master's degree. And that usually in their system requires something like five to seven years at university. Interestingly, again, Finnish children do not start school. They don't start formal learning until they're seven. And the expectation and requirement is that they will learn everything. Languages, at least three of them. The sciences, the humanities, the arts. <clears throat> there is a negligible learning gap because early intervention is the norm. That's where they put their attention. There's no streaming or subject selection until the top two upper secondary years. Now, it might sound a bit rigid, uh, and there are, um, there's a lot of, lot of structured thought that's clearly gone into this. But in fact, it's the individual teacher trained to a very high level of professionalism who has a lot of autonomy. Now here, in our system, we're insisting on a lot of principal autonomy. Now I don't have a problem with that if that principal is well trained in pedagogy and is a significant leader and is someone who is prepared, as I say, to go where the evidence leads. Now, one depressing tale I've heard recently from a young maths teacher who's a friend of mine. She's teaching very highly motivated, highly skilled. She's teaching in a regional Victorian school where the principal has decreed without consultation that the lower secondary students should be streamed into different maths classes. Now, all of the evidence tells us that streaming does not work. It sends a message straight away to the underachievers that they're the dummies. And you don't expect much from them, and you're going to segregate them. In this particular school, the problems are actually a lack of expertise. There aren't enough maths teachers trained at the level that my young friend is. Such is the deficit of maths teachers this is where we've really got to think about the segmentation in our system, that at this particular school they've taken the young PE teacher off the playground and they've put him in to teach year nine maths. He is struggling. I can't be the only person to be concerned about this. And about how that school will handle its share of the extra Gonski funding, because that school, because it's a low ECS school, will get probably in the order, the indexes are still being worked out on this, and we don't know what the Victorian response would be, but that school could get uh, an additional $1,500 to $2,000 per student. That's a lot of money. If in 10 years we have significantly increased funding to schools, and we are still seeing indifferent results because we've not rethought our structures and our learning methods, then I think there are going to be a lot more red faces. And it will have been a significant policy failure. Now, I know that sounds very gloomy, um, and uh, I, I shouldn't leave the wrong impression. I think uh, Gonski is the way to go, and I'm hoping that the states sign up, that there has to be um, strict accountability. I'd equally just mention some stories um, that point to um, a much more enlivening and positive outlook. Roseworth Primary School is a school I visited at the beginning of the year. It's 30 minutes from Perth CBD, but it caters to a community where very few parents work, uh, where all of the social indicators you know, are down on the graph. To give you an idea of how um, 
poorly cared for. Some of these children are. Some of these children arrive at school to start school in, their, in uh, say year one, and they're not even toilet trained. So significant parenting deficits. When Principal Jeff Metcalf took over a few years ago, terrific bloke. You know, he worked in bush schools, very remote schools in across Western Australia. So <coughs> he wasn't any novice. He also had an academic background. He had time in as an administrator of the bureaucracy, so he'd seen education at every level. This guy arrives here, and he inherited a school where most teachers were either afraid, afraid to get out of their cars in the morning, or once they got to their classrooms, they were certainly afraid to leave that classroom at lunchtime. Not because of the kids, but because the, the playground was such a violent place because actually out of work parents would come on to the school grounds and brawl um, at lunchtime. This is kind of considered normal, and it was tolerated for a long time. In every way, this was a toxic environment. Now, Jeff Metcalf's first job was actually not about pedagogy, it was about safety. You actually can't teach in an unsafe school. So what he did, he set clear guidelines, he had some very, very difficult, confronting conversations with parents. He rebuilt the school, and they've had significant funding. The school looks marvellous. He established well-patrolled exits and entrances. And five years later, uh, this school now wins awards for being a safe, congenial place for students and for teachers. And instead of being the last place that any teacher wants to sign up and work, uh, teachers now see this as a desirable location. I I've glossed over all the difficulties, but you can just imagine it didn't help, obviously happen in five minutes. But what impressed me about this guy, and he is an exceptional leader, he could lead in any any kind of uh, structure, any kind of institution. It's the way Jeff Metcalf realises he cannot do everything by himself. He's created some very effective partnerships, and this, I think, points the way to the future. And again, David Gonski, to his great credit, has got a lot in his report about this. Metcalf has uh, partnerships with the Smith family. They perform a vital service in making the links with um, the uh, the parents in that community and trying to get some decent kind of engagement. You can imagine most of those parents hated school themselves. It's not a place they were wanted to go to. So they've passed on all those negative feelings to their children. So that has to be, you have to attempt to turn that around as well. Very good partnerships with um, an extraordinary philanthropist called Annie Fogarty, who's, uh, got the, uh, who's established the Fogarty Foundation and is on the board of the school. This is actually a differently structured system in Perth in, in WA they have the independent government school sector. Um, it's very interesting to watch how that's operating. So that's another partnership. There's a partnership with playgroups. Because nobody works, there's no long there's no long daycare. So they actually have playgroups on site um, at the school. The playgroup is run by a very significant academic from Edith Cowan University. So she's there, she said I can much more easily affect change here at this school by having a conversation in the sandpit with a mum about how she parents her child. And clearly she's using all of that practical experience to feel her research, but I was just very impressed with that aspect. So they're looking at the whole, whole experience here. The other important partnership is with the university, with Edith Cowan University, and their student teachers do their placements in this school and undertake research projects about classroom practice. As I say, they're bringing all, it was one of the most impressive schools I've seen. Most importantly of all, Jeff Metcalf is doing what the graduate school talks about all the time. He is measuring impact. He has all of the resources he needs. He's actually one principal who will say, I don't need another dollar. Not many will say that. But what he needs is consistency. And he needs a team of teachers dedicated, as he is, to ensuring that children actually receive a year's growth for a year's work. Not just, you know, they might be absent for, you know, um, five days a month. He thinks of the learning, it just doesn't happen, but just out of absenteeism. So the measure has to be there. So imagine, if you're going to provide what every school needs to provide, a year's growth for a year's work, children actually have to be there. So that means working with all of these other organisations, Smith family and everyone else, to ensure that parents see the importance of sending them to school, their, their child to school, every day, not just every other day. I think until we can confidently say about our schools, sorry, I think unless we can confidently say this about all our schools, 
their measuring impact. We can't talk with any confidence about a change system and one that meets Ken Robinson's criteria, and that's a system that helps children not just reach their potential, but go beyond their potential. So just a few things to think about, I think, in what will be a very charged political environment this year, uh, as the political class you know, digests and argues about uh, the Goldsky formula. I would like to think there will be a vigorous contest of ideas. I'm not so sure about that, we'll see. <laughs> I think, though, the extent to which we get this right in the coming years, a richer learning experience for all our children will say a great deal about our values, about what we prize, and about who we are. So I'll end there. I'll be more than happy to take your questions. Thank you. Second point, there's, there's plenty of evidence that we've now got, you know, teachers teaching to the test and all the rest of the problem. I don't have any problem with, with, if you like, assessment. I mean, I'll tell you what the Finns do. They have no formal assessment until the last two years of schooling. So there's no equivalent of NAPLAN, there's no national testing. But what's happening within those schools, and remember I said that teacher, that incredibly well-trained teacher, has a lot of... Um, authority and independence, and what he or she is doing with that is at every stage of the game in the classroom, every day, every week, every month, is assessing where that child is at. There's a lot of reviewing and consultation. consultation. So when they do their version, I hope, of Hamlet, there is plenty, after they've done the text, and hopefully acted it out, and had all you know, the rich, wonderful dramatic experiences, and, and, and the insights into psychology you can get from examining, you know, one of our great classics. At the end of that process, there's a hell of a lot of internal assessment. That teacher will have a very, very clear idea of who knows, you know, what Polonius said in his speech. They will know that. They won't get to the end of the year or at the end of the two years or, in fact, even at the end of, you know, secondary school and say, oh, they missed that. So they have a very clear idea of what's going on, but it's not this external uh, assessment. Now, I fear what we've done, and the lesson is being picked up, and people like Barrett and Gore and others are looking at this now. The NAPLAN, as I say, is a very low standard. A very low standard. And this is why we've got the shock of our lives with pearls. Pearls clearly sets a higher standard. And actually, when you set a higher standard, I, know, I had the great benefit of teachers who actually said to me, that's a pretty ordinary effort. You can do better than that. And if it was someone I liked and someone I wanted to impress, I turned myself inside out to make sure I did a better job the next time. I've always responded that way in my professional life. I, I've had a lot of, um, I've been blessed really, I've had a lot of very generous mentors, certainly in my broadcasting career. Not so much in politics, I have to say, because it's a bit of a zero-sum game there. Everyone else wants you to fail, actually, but that's another story. But if you have the privilege of either learning or working with people who want to stretch you, want to get the best out of you, and actually something out of you that you may not mind not even think's there, that's a wonderful position to be in. So I agree with you, and the, the chance of the moment, we've got to lift the benchmarks, lift the bench, but lift the content. As I said, I want, um, it's not that I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not hung up on the classics, but I actually want children, whether they're poor children or affluent children, to leave actually knowing there's a thing called the canon. But, you know, by all means, do everything else. And as Chris, you know, there's never been 
an easier way to access all this new material. You know, like, like this, you, you can dial up a YouTube and see some of the best actors in the world doing everything. You can go to the best art galleries in the world and be exposed to, as I say, the, the riches of, of Western civilization and everything else. So let's use that technology to enrich us. Sorry, John Ellis. Thank you, Max. I commend you on your presentation today and, and both the passion and depth with which you've spoken about education is clearly an interest of yours. What, uh, if I could take you into the international uh, perspective on this, you've talked a lot about comparisons today and uh, where Australia sits uh, in regards to international benchmarks. Uh, but why are those important to us? But what is it uh, in terms of Australia's position within, uh, I suppose, a global uh, economy and society now uh, that makes education so important? What's the relevance of this education to the uh, global economy? Well, it's important in and of itself. I mean, uh, ed education, you know, um, enriches us in, in so many ways. You know, I, I'm standing here today, the product of um, 12 mostly happy years at a, a Catholic girls' convent in Brisbane called All Hallows, a wonderful place that was established by the nuns in 1860. Great tradition and all the rest of it. And as I say, I was taught by a few people who, you know, shouldn't have been let near children. <laughs> Some of them went in for ritual humiliation, but by the time I got to high school, most of them are gone. And I was taught by wonderful women who just, you know, opened my horizons onto a wider world. So in and of itself, it is, is important. Um, I think there's a question of national pride as well. I don't think we should be content with number 27. But I think there's both, as I say, there's the, the personal issue of, of, um, of enrichment. And I do think there's the issue then of, of um, economic productivity. I don't particularly like framing the debate this, this way, but here we are, we talk about being a critical player in the Asian century, and if Singapore and South Korea and Hong Kong and Shanghai, Shanghai only got in to take part in these international tests for recent years, they're up the top. And it's not because they're applying a a rope method or the old Confucian method at all. Some of the greatest innovation, the most interesting innovation um, in education today is happening in Shanghai classrooms. Uh, very, very interesting. I think the other question here goes back to actually what uh, the other part of the answer, why we should worry about this, goes back to what Ken Robinson said. You see, we are moving into the post industrial age. We're at a period of transition, not unlike uh, what my grandparents went through at the beginning of the great-grandparents really, at the end of the 1800s, as the 1800s clipped over to the 1900s. Time of spectacular change, another time of globalisation, extraordinary technological breakthroughs, when work changed dramatically. Well, we're going through that again now. As, as Robinson said, you can do a degree today, but you actually can't confidently say to anyone, that degree will give you X. That degree will give you 40 years of this. If anyone is saying that, that now, that is just, that, that, yeah, that is, um, that's delusional. So actually, and why, so why we need to, to rethink education, we need to rethink it so that more and more young people feel confident with change on a spectacular scale of the type we never had to absorb before, so they can be flexible enough to either think about creating their own work uh, or to fit themselves into whatever will be the new structures. I mean, it's an unsettling time for me, period, but it's also, there's great possibilities there. I'm not seeing, uh, thank you, first of all, and uh, a question. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it very much, and I've learned so much in relation to our education system. The question is, how much uh, is it the fault of our teacher unions that uh, they are focusing so much on the uh, rights of the teachers as they want the union to do, rather than looking at the overall interest of the country as far as education is concerned. Now, I noticed some of the, uh, the teacher unions can appear to be uh, resistant to some changes, and we do hear an awful lot from them about uh, performance bonuses and class sizes and all those things that actually, when you consider, again, um, uh, other countries, don't make much difference in the classroom. Um, but I will get, give great credit to um, certainly the Australian Education Union because they have uh, backed the, um, the Gonski changes all the way and at a time when, in fact, they could have been 
um, very argumentative about some aspects of that report. It's had a focus that not all of their members would have been, been happy with, but they got behind it because they think it's it's critically important, as I say, to have that, uh, to, to basically change the, the formula and the way that we have this new resource standard. So I give them credit for that. But I think now that we, now that, you know, uh, that looks to be the case, we'll have to see, I think what we'll be wanting to say, what I'll be looking to see from them, is if they are as focused on all of these quality um, classroom issues as well, all these things that we know actually make a difference. I think the big question for them as well, and it's clearly been broached in the recent agreements in Victoria, is the question, is the, the extent to which those teachers who are not uh, achieving annually to a certain performance level um, can be exited from the system. Uh, we don't tolerate failure in, in other areas, so we shouldn't tolerate failure in our schools. I think the other issue that the unions will have to face over time, we're actually training to, in some states, not all states, we're actually training too many teachers, but perversely we're not training enough of the right kinds of teachers. As I said, we're spectacularly underdone in terms of the provision of maths teachers, science teachers, and I would also say music and general arts teachers. A great tragedy now is once you could go into, you know, every government school and there would be teachers there, all of whom could play the piano or some instruments or whatever. Most of our government schools, you know, don't even have music programs these days. Mm -hmm. And it has to be provided by philanthropic groups. And, and some are, like the song room and other. Fan but fancy not, how, how dare we, you know, say we're a, you know, an affluent country and we don't provide basic music programs to primary children. When we know how, again, you know, what, what an important part this is. Again, there's plenty of evidence that if you do, if you're involved in the arts, this has a positive effect on, on your learning in so many other areas. So I, this question of we've got a we've got a system now that's driving many you know um, far too many people actually into doing teacher training, when I think we actually have to um, consider much more what Melbourne is doing, be very selective about who gets to train as a teacher, um, and then be <coughs> provide generous and adequate remuneration, but also insist on performance standards being met. <coughs> year on year and continue professional development. Mm -hmm. And that will be the issue for you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Elizabeth. Uh, I just wanted to ask, do uh, you think that the emphasis must be on teachers and not on the general public? Uh, the, our parents, for instance. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, well, I've ignored there that the primary educators are parents. Mm -hmm. The primary educators are parents. But again, it's very isn't it interesting, um, and it, it's not just the case in our most disadvantaged communities. Uh, whether it's parents have less time or feel less skilled or, I guess, you know, uh, we, we live in an age where we want to turn everything over to the experts. Uh, but um, I know that I learned my times table from my mother, who was also a teacher, I have to say. <laughs> um, but no, you make a very, a very good point. Again, one of the reasons we are insisting on if you like, trained professionals in early childhood, so many more children now are not at home, that they are in, you know, in formal care because parents are working. So those people have to um, be providing both pastoral care and pedagogical practice. Okay. Well, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I think it's been a very important issue. And I'm going to be awful and introduce the political idea. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to know what you think about what's appeared in the age recently that the liberal states are not very interested in Gonski because they think that once Tony Abbott gets elected, which they're assuming he will, that it will all just fall by the board and no one will think any more about it. Yes. Well, there, there are lots of games being played at the moment. Uh, I'm surprised. I thought after Barry O'Farrell, the Premier of New South Wales, a Liberal Premier, who was, I have to say, right from the word go, was very supportive of the whole Gonski formula, as was his education minister, Adrian Pickley. And uh, they signed up last week. O'Farrell said, OK, I'm putting in 1.7 billion, which, by the way, was the amount that he took out of the system last year. Um, the feds have come up with 3 billion. He liked the sound of that. That had added up to about 5 billion billion. He could go out there and he'll, he'll, he'll sell that as his own, right? So I actually thought Victoria would have announced by now uh, or the ACT, or perhaps the Queensland, although the Queenslanders are playing a very strange game as well. Um, uh, 
uh, they should uh, they should take heed because their results are pretty pretty ordinary. Look, um, uh, clearly Christopher Pine has made it clear that um, uh, they will not continue with any Gonski style um, funding unless all states agree between now and the end of June. So they kind of set that there. I am hopeful that, as I say, the couple of the other big liberal controlled states will fall in in some agreements in the next month or so. I've, I've got no inside knowledge about that, but I, I just hope they, they will. I do know that there are, uh, for all the political games that are being played, there are still, um, there's a lot of detailed work going on about what the yearly indexation lift will be, an important issue. So you can imagine, you know, no one wants to sign a quick agreement if it means in a year's time to say, well, we got done on that. Um, so it's it's not all you know shadow play. Thank you. Um, the, everything you said there is, is quite familiar to me, but the point is this, do, um, uh, uh, do you then say, I mean the, the, the facts you've laid out are true, we now, we now live in a, um, for all of the, that we are we're not the United States and all the rest of it, we, we, have, we now live in a significantly segregated society, but I don't, I don't see that many poor people where, where I live, 
you know, because poor people live, live elsewhere. Um, but I do know that not far from the Melbourne CBD, or it be true of Sydney, or as I said, in, in Perth, you can have high schools where, private, where the, the students who come from the local primary school will arrive with a year three or year four reading level, if that. So then what's, what's the response of that school? Well, um, with adequate resourcing, um, uh, that's, that school needs to do all of the things that I was talking about that Jeff Metcalf is doing. Uh, nearly all of those poor schools now would have uh, breakfast programs. That's become a sort of a more a common feature these days. So often those children will arrive at school actually very early and the first thing that happens is, is, is they are fed. Uh, so that is, again, like the Scandinavian model, you know, they get a hot meal in the, in the middle of the day. All those things are cared for. The other thing I didn't mention at, uh, um, at Roseworth, they're, they're called a hub school. All of the medical and dental needs, very important, of these children are catered to. They have a dental clinic there. When I went and talked to the dental clinicians there and I said, what sort of conditions are you dealing with? They said, well, we, we see very young children with rotting teeth. Uh, because they live on a diet of coke, right? Well, again, they're trying. What they what it, what's what's the response to that? Well, you deal with that, but you also try and educate parents. So they are running nutrition programs with parents, and again, this is where the Smith family comes in. I am hoping, as I say, the and this is why the, you can't go past it. We talk about teachers, we talk about parents, but I have to say, where I see all of these things brought together along the lines of what Scandinavia's been, Scandinavian countries have done for years, you have a very significant leader who arrives at that school and says, I'm not going to put up with this. This is not tolerable. And I'm going to use all the available resources, whether it's partnering with, with the philanthropic groups or whatever, to get what we need, whether it's a breakfast program, whether it's a dental clinic, um, uh, whether it's um, truanting officers, uh, whether it's literacy coaches, you get all of those resources. Now, as I say, in some states, there, there has not been the money, the extra resourcing for all of those things. Gonski means we can breach that gap, but it won't be breached if we've got people who are saying, oh, well, you, know, you, can't, you can't do much for these kids. Now, I, can, I understand that attitude. You can't, but there are the things you can't change, but that there are things that you can try and, and change. It's very, your point about nutrition, bullying is another one. When they do the surveys on why children are not performing well on pools or any of these other tests, one thing that comes up over and over again, children are either tired, they're too tired to learn, they haven't got much food in their stomachs, or they're being bullied at school. I noticed you haven't mentioned class size. I mentioned it briefly before. Um, again, uh, all of, I know it's a very contentious issue with teachers, uh, except in early learning, where you clearly want, with with very small, with very young children, you want a high ratio of carers with small groups of children. Um, in terms of formal schooling, whether it's 20, 25, uh, 30, um, it doesn't seem to make much difference. If you've got again, again, I, I stress, if you've got the added added supports. But it doesn't seem to make much difference to the educational um, outcome. That's, that's what the evidence tells us. Uh, for instance, um, I, I know people who we had the, uh, the Grattan Institute had the uh, heads of Singapore, Shanghai, and others out here recently. And when the gentleman from Shanghai explained um, what their teachers are required to do, they are often teaching very, very large class sizes, you know, I mean, 40, 50 plus, right? It's crowd control except they're Chinese and it's not. So, but the trade-off, they actually are not teaching. They have a shorter teaching load than Australian teachers. They teach a, a large number of students, but for fewer hours a week. And the, at the other time, though, they are required to be um, uh, working with their peers, looking at what's going on in this class compared with that class. If someone's got a better math score than that, what are you doing? So a lot of peer review, and they're required to do a lot of research projects. So the out-of-class time is all about further enriching that teacher's professional capacity. Quite, quite interesting. So that's the, tra that's the trade-off they make. Yeah. Mm. Um, you mentioned that the current thinking is that possibly too many teachers are being trained and not the right sort of people to start with. But has anyone looked at the actual presentation of teacher training? Are teachers actually being taught to teach 
and have, has anyone looked at what's going on, as you mentioned, in Finland, um, Shanghai, and these other places? That's right. That, that is precisely what's happening now. In fact, there's a lot of comment. In fact, a lot of teachers will say themselves, the surveys of uh, young teachers in their first or second year out will be, and it's why you get um, um, a significant dropout. I imagine putting a, you know, a 23-year-old is suddenly in front of a bunch of 15-year-old boys and they go, oh my goodness, no one told me it was like this. Well, I have to say one of the great, I'm, I'm not here exclusively to spruik for the Melbourne Graduate School, although I, I love what they do, but one of the reasons that their clinical practice model is so highly prized, and I, I gather they're about to get some very good news again that they're ranked very, very highly in terms of um, you know, global rankings. Um, one of the reasons that uh, their teachers feel better prepared for the classroom experience is they have so much exposure to it. The day you enrol down the road, um, you're in a classroom. It's uh, three days at basically in the lecture hall and two days in, in a classroom. So the MGSE has a lot of partner schools. And so right from the beginning of your training, you are there in the classroom observing uh, working with master teachers. Uh, it's why this is a more expensive program, but it certainly is producing a graduate who feels that much more confident and comfortable with different classroom, um, you know, dynamics. It's a bit, it's, again, this is, this is where we're having the argument. Um, it's, it's, as I say, it is, it's a demonstrable fact that we are training too many. The waiting lists in both New South Wales and Victoria uh, to actually get a job in schools and government schooling is huge. We've got a massive oversupply, particularly of primary teachers. And as I say, about a deficit of the math of all the specialties. We, we need content-rich teachers who also have, as I say, the specialist teaching skills. So we've got this real mismatch in our system. I would love to take that excess of primary teachers and give them some early childhood training and get them in preschools and in their early childhood settings. Um, Victoria, to its great credit, provides the same pay parity for a, a trained early childhood teacher to work in a preschool or in a long daycare centre as they do if they were, say, in a primary school. That's terrific. But not all, we need to solve the industrial issues and other issues that the unions could take on, actually. Because they should be paid the same. They seem to be very generous with extensive answers to all their questions. Um, so maybe, does anyone have one more learning question with the board members? That's one here, thank you. Uh, Maxine, thank you for what you've told us today. As a long-standing senior retired teacher, I'm very intrigued at the way in which students go into teaching. Often, they come in with a very good degree, but they don't have any Yes, I think I, I personally favour, and this is contentious, but I personally favour um, uh, a quite dramatic um, a rise in the, uh, the requirement, the ATAR rankings, right? Yes. At the moment, for Victoria, uh, you go from, as I say, uh, Melbourne, where you have to be a graduate, and a graduate with a grade point average, you know, above a certain level, to some of the regional institutions mm -hmm. who will take um, uh, undergrads with very, very low ATAR, uh, 45, 50. Well, this, you know, whatever you think of that, you know, it's a rank, it's not a mark, I know all that, but it means you're in the bottom 50%, you're certainly not in the top 30 or top 20%. Yeah. That is going to affect your own capacity to deal with academic work at university, certainly your capacity to teach at all levels, whether it's a struggling student or a very bright student. I just think that's too low, and the message it sends to our best students is that anyone can do teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, not everyone can do med, not everyone can do law. Uh, in my old game of journalism, I, mean, I think this is a bit ridiculous, but to get into a communications course, you need one of the top schools in the country. So why are we saying that anyone can do teaching? Um, so I, again, I think, now, if we change that model, the financial and business implications for a lot of our universities is huge because a lot of universities just basically bankroll their models by churning uh, students through teaching courses. So it has big policy implications. Uh, but I, I just think, given what I've outlined here, now I think we also have to be more, again, a bit, a bit like the, the Finns as well. But again, if you do primary teaching 
uh, at, um, in Helsinki at the university, um, they expect, again, some of their best students, you know, 20%, 30%, to do the higher electives in maths. So the education department works very, very closely with the maths department. And again, the most prized uh, graduates are those with you know, significant um, training in, in maths and the other specialties. So I, I, we've really got to address this issue of what we require, what our needs are, but what the system is churning out.